At the turn of the last century, at about the time that my grandparents were born, the uh, scientists and engineers at that time had a few curious questions on their mind. Among them were such things as, what does the inside of an atom look like? What do different observers measure the same speed of light regardless of their particular motion? Can humans fly? These curious questions didn't have any apparent usefulness at the time that they were asked, but they ultimately shaped the world that we live in today. Computers, electronics, nuclear energy, a man on the moon. Curiosity was the catalyst for evolution of our modern world. This is what Mars was thought to look like at that time. And one of the tantalizing questions that this image uh, brought to people's minds was whether or not intelligent life could exist on the surface of Mars. Percival Lowell was an astronomer at about this time, and he was the first to pioneer the idea of placing an observatory on the top of a mountain to get above the disturbing thick atmosphere down below. Using his telescopes, he arguably had the best view of Mars of anybody else in the world. And what he discovered, what he reported, is this network of crisscrossing channels going across the planet, these straight line channels going from one spot to another, which suggest the possibility of intelligent life responsible for building them. He reasoned that um, this network of channels must be transporting water from the melting polar ice caps down to an arid equatorial region where an advanced civilization might be trying to eke out an existence on a dying planet. And as you can imagine, that notion captured the imagination of many a science fiction writer and Hollywood producer since then. It took 70 years for technology to catch up with imagination. This is the, uh, an image of Marge constructed up from photographs taken by the Viking orbiters during the 1970s. And what they revealed was a planet that did not have any canals. They proved that Percival Lowell was indeed wrong about the notion of these canals. But what it also revealed is the, the presence of these features on the surface, which apparently look like water must have been present to carve out these features on the surface of Mars. So it, it opened another question about what the possibility of life on Mars was. Next. These uh, Viking missions also had landers, which descended down to the surface and revealed a cold, barren, dry, harsh environment exposed to the sun's radiation. And it really did not leave much room for the existence of life on the surface of the planet. And Mars was left for dead for almost 20 years until in the 1990s, we uh, landed this small, plucky little rover on the surface of Mars. A bunch of engineers who dared to think that they can put a rover on Mars using landing bags as a technology to place the rover on the surface came up with this idea. And in doing so, they reignited the interest of Mars among the public. And NASA capitalized on this interest and restructured its investigation of Mars in the years that followed. And that restructuring told us to follow the water. Everywhere we find water on Earth, in the most extreme environments, from the bottom of the Antarctic Arctic to the highest uh, slopes on mountains, we find life. And this suggests that where there may have been life, sorry, where there may have been water, life may have existed in the past. And this is what we found when we began exploring Mars with this in mind. First, we found blueberries. Blueberries were actually hematite, a mineral, an iron mineral that is known on uh, Earth to be formed in the presence of water. We also found uh, pure white silica dredged up from underneath the surface of the planet by a broken wheel on one of our rovers. This mineral is known to form in hot springs uh, here on Earth. And next. And the jackpot, water ice just below the topsoil near the North Pole on Mars, proof that H2O still exists on the planet. But it still left many questions remained unanswered. If Mars was once a warm, wet planet in its past, what happened to it that made, made it the cold, barren planet that we see today? And if there was water in the past, 
over three billion years ago, at the same time that water was on Earth and life was forming, could life have formed on Mars? These are the questions that Curiosity was designed to answer. Our rover technology evolved quite a bit since uh, we landed Sojourner, the microwave oven-sized rover that we landed in 1997. In 2004, we dropped in two rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, about the size of a small golf cart. These rovers were designed for operation for only 90 days on the surface. And today, Opportunity, nine years later, is still going strong, long beyond its 90-day warranty. Enter Curiosity. The uh, bold questions that we're trying to answer with this rover require uh, a leap in technology, both in capabilities, size, and landing technique. Curiosity is bristling with uh, scientific instruments. Um, as an extension of our senses, our human senses, we've got 17 different cameras on board Curiosity, two of which are on the top of the mast and provide high definition color movies and pictures of the landscape at Mars. Also in the mast, you can see a, a laser that we use to zap rocks from a safe distance. And from the vapor that's created from those, that, uh, that laser, we can actually look at it and discern what that rock, uh, what the elemental composition of that rock is. So that gives us capability to do remote investigations without getting into too much trouble with our rover. But the, the real marquee instruments that we have in, in, are the in, inside the belly of the rover. We brought with us a wet chemistry lab and an x-ray diffraction machine to help us analyze the soil and rock samples that we'll be acquiring and determine what their composition is. Rather than bringing a, a Mars rock back with us to the Earth to analyze in Earth's laboratories, we brought with us the laboratory to Mars to do the analysis there. So where's a good place to drop Curiosity in for exploration? These uh, yellow sites are the previous landing sites of our rovers and landers over the history of Martian exploration. And we decided to land Curiosity right there at Gale Crater. Gale Crater shows evidence of a watery past. Zooming in on it, on the north rim of the crater in red, you can see a canyon slicing through the, uh, the crater wall. And below that canyon spread out as an alluvial fan at the bottom of the crater, suggesting water must have been present. In the center of the crater, we have a 15,000-foot mountain with many layers along its slopes, suggesting a long history of water depositing those layers over time. And most tantalizing of all, we, have, we see clay minerals from orbit, suggesting that not only that these minerals could have been put down by water in, in, in the past at Mars, but they're also the best minerals for preserving organic material that may have been trapped in those minerals over three billion years ago. And that's what Curiosity was designed to look for. So that's our destination, those clay minerals in the foothills of Mount Sharp. But how do you land a one-ton rover the size of a car in a 96-mile diameter crater with a 15,000-foot mountain in the center of that crater? You have to evolve. And let's see what happened. Things that are looking good, coming up on entry. Vehicle reports entry interface. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere uh, as we go in here. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth G's. Yes. Commercial 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. Have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. The parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Feet chill step has separated. We're on the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers descending. Standing by for batch separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single to us, you remain strong.
Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. All right, I've seen that hundreds of times, and it never gets old. Um, so this was one of the first iconic pictures that came down from the rover a few hours after landing. And uh, with the, set, the sun setting behind us, we can see the shadow of the rover cast on the Martian landscape. And in the distance, we can see Mount Sharp, our destination. And in the foothills are those clay minerals that we came to look for. But first, we're going to take a look around to see where we landed and see what's nearby. And uh, what we see just to the east of us from Bradbury Landing, that's the landing spot where uh, we came down, which was uh, named after Ray Bradbury, the science fiction author. Uh, Glen Elg destination is um, very suggestive. This white, light tone fractured rock is very suggestive of a dry lake bed that we might see here on Earth. So immediately, the team got really interested. We landed on only several hundred, hundred meters away from it. And so we immediately wanted to drive over there and see what was up with this really interesting geography. But we took a look around immediately in the immediate vicinity of the rover. And what we saw, the thrusters during our landing had scoured away the soil and dirt and dust and revealed this underlying bedrock. This bedrock looks like concrete that somebody just poured into the surface of Mars. And as we drove toward our destination, we see another, uh, more evidence of this conglomerate rock loose pebbles, rounded stones, cemented together by some process. And yet again, another big slab of this conglomerate rock looks like a sidewalk that's been jackhammered and lifted up, revealing a cross section that again shows these cemented rocks and pebbles together. The scientists tell us that these types of rocks form at the bottom of very fast moving streams. And this was one of the first discoveries of, uh, one of the first scientific discoveries of our mission Yet, yes, indeed, at one time in the Martian past, a river did run through it. So as we continued toward our destination, looking for that dry lake bed, which we now call Yellowknife Bay, we came upon this sand drift. And uh, one of the objectives of the mission is to analyze and scoop up and analyze the soil. We have a, a scoop mechanism on the end of our robotic arm that we can use to acquire that material and then process it for delivery to the instruments that are inside the rover. And we went through this campaign. And uh, this is the first x-ray diffraction experiment ever run on another planet. The rings in this image tell us what the composition of that soil is. And we found it to be sand of a volcanic origin, perhaps with a little water and some other minerals mixed in. We also took a really deep breath of the Martian atmosphere to see what the constituents of the Martian atmosphere was. And one of the other first discoveries that we made on the mission was the fact that argon, rather than nitrogen, turns out to be the most second abundant uh, constituent in the atmosphere of Mars. This experiment also revealed that over time, the Martian atmosphere has escaped into space, suggesting that long ago in the, Marsh, in Martian, the Mars uh, history, the atmosphere must have been much thicker. And finally, we get to our destination, Yellowknife Bay. And looking around the landscape, we can see these large flat rocks that have been fractured. Looks very much like a dry lake bed in the Mojave Desert in California. And we set up shop here to begin our campaign of drilling into these rocks to acquire a sample from deep within it to deposit into our chemistry and uh, x-ray diffraction experiments. And this, before we did that, we actually reached out and touched 
the rock um, to brush away some of the soil that was covering the, the exterior of the rock. And it revealed that you know, below this rusty colored sand, we actually see a lighter toned rock, which suggests that it's made of something else. Those bristles in our brush also scratch the surface up pretty good, suggesting that these rocks are pretty soft, perhaps a siltstone or a mudstone that was deposited here in the action of water. This is what we came to look for. These are the types of rocks that perhaps harbor clay minerals inside them, which could potentially uh, have preserved those organic molecules, those key ingredients of life over three billion years. And this is the first drill of a rock on another planet. The first drill was in the lower right corner. It was a two centimeter depth drill to prove out the system, to test the engineering elements. And the second drill, a full depth six, min, six mil, um, centimeter uh, uh, drill, acquired that sample from inside the rock and pulled it up into the drill in the sample acquisition system where we could examine it in our scoop. And here you see that sample, this light toned sample in stark contrast to that rusty colored sand that we had previously analyzed. And that's because this material has been preserved inside of that rock for billions of years and has been kept away from the harsh oxidizing environment in the Martian uh, exterior. This is a three billion year old time capsule from the inside of this rock at Mars. So we've since deposited that uh, time capsule in our analytical instruments. And uh, we've run the experiments. We've collected the data. The uh, scientists are analyzing that data at this time. And we're waiting with bated breath to find out what they've discovered. In the meantime, this is our ultimate destination, the foothills of Mount Sharp. And in this image, which is about 10 kilometers away, you can see these layers in the canyon walls going up the slope. Each one of these layers is a page in the history book of Mars. The lower pages, the lower layers being the oldest layers, and the highest layers being the most recent. And our mission is going to be to uh, drive to this region, look for those clay minerals, and then read that history book of Mars as we climb the slopes. Next. And to give you an, ideal, uh, an idea of the scale of uh, these canyon walls and hills and buttes, that boulder circled in red, which is a dot in this image, is the size of Curiosity. By the time we get there and are in the presence of these majestic hills and buttes, it's going to be a really amazing sight, and I can't wait to see it. So we're going to begin our exploration as we go up Mount Sharp, and we're going to try to answer those questions. What happened to Mars? Why at one time was it warm and wet, and now it's a cold and dry planet? Could life have existed? when it was a warm and wet planet? And could life exist there today? And potentially answer that most profound and humbling question, are we alone in the universe? Thank you. Go LSU. Go Curiosity.